Welcome to this episode of Grassroots Advocacy. Uh, in our last segment, we talked about um, advocacy at the point of care or advocating on behalf of the women and men that you serve on a daily basis. In this episode, we are going to continue that discussion and we're going to look at a couple of other ways that you can advocate for those who you provide care for. And so we talked about the fact that as a, a, an advocate, you're speaking up on behalf of your elders, your residents, your patients, your neighbors, whichever term you use to describe the people that you care for. And we talked about the fact that you do that in, in the ways of, of speaking up with your fellow nursing assistants to make sure that everybody understands residents' rights. Um, and, and residents' preferences and respecting them and, and their dignity. We also talked about that same sort of concept, but as it relates to your licensed and registered staff and the other departments in your care setting. In this episode, we want to focus on um, your role in the care planning process and your potential role in the quality assurance and performance improvement process. <clears throat> um, Long-term care originally uh, had some pretty substantial regulations implemented uh, in the, uh, around 1990 based on the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1987, which was signed into law by Pre President Ronald Reagan. And in the regulations, um, we talked about the need for care planning for individuals who are receiving care. And those, the notions from that regulation were then updated in the conditions of participation that we started to implement uh, in 2016. And so I want to give you a moment to look at the current regulation as it relates to the care planning process. And so it says that... Um, a comprehensive care plan, the facility must develop and implement a comprehensive person-centered care plan for each resident. Now, what they're really trying to say here is, is a couple of things. Number one, would you agree that each of the people that you provide care for is unique and individual and has a different sets of needs? Some people are very independent and some people require a great deal of assistance. And so for that reason, it's really important that care plans be individualized to address that unique person, that unique individual person. The regulation also says that the, that care, the care plan process needs to has, have measurable goals and objectives and needs to be time phased. In other words, we need to set it up so that we could, by doing X, Y, and Z, achieve an improved outcome by a particular date. Now, the new regulation goes a teeny bit further, and if we look at FTAG um, 657, it actually redefines the interdisciplinary team. And the interdisciplinary team is a group of people who get together to create the individualized person-centered care plans. The, probably the newest uh, piece of the regulation is that it says that a nursing assistant with responsibility for the resident being care planned must be on the care plan team. And that is something kind of new for us. So here's what I'd like to ask you to think about. As a, as a caregiver, you have the opportunity to help create a care plan that is more customized, that is more specific, and that is more unique for each of the people that you care for. Now, I would imagine that there may be a few of you as you're listening to this right now, you're like, what? I got to go to another meeting? I've got 12 people on my hall assignment. Do, uh, what are we going to do? And I think that's a realistic and reasonable response. I do want to encourage you, though, to think about it this way. Have you ever seen a care plan that was written and you read that care plan for that particular person and you thought, oh, man, that'll never work. And then the charge nurse says, well, we got to do it anyway. Try it and let's see if it works. Let's see how it works out. So then you try it and it doesn't really work out. 
because it was an individual and it wasn't customized for that particular person. So you wasted a lot of time. So while you may spend a little bit of time in the care planning process, I'm inclined to believe that you're going to save a lot more time over the long run simply by getting it right the first time for that individual, for that individual elder. So as you're thinking about your possible role in the care planning process, there are a couple of things I would like to ask you to think about. The first is, as we all know, CNAs, nursing assistants, um, AL caregivers, folks like yourselves are the eyes and the ears of the licensed and registered folks. You are statistically the first person to observe changes in status, whether they be physical, social, or emotional. Because you're the first to make those observations, you play an integral role or an important role in the process of creating a care plan that really identifies and meets the needs of each unique person. The next thing that I'd like you to think about as it relates to the care planning process is, if you think about it on a daily basis, you do a number of tasks that have a potential, potential indication that there may be some changes happening. For example, you're the person likely who's charting the INOs, the intakes and outputs, and as a result, you know that Miss Bessie is not eating as much as she normally eats, and that's not normal for her. Or you're the person who's collecting the vitals on a daily basis, and you've noticed that Mrs. So-and-so seems to have an elevated temp. These are all pieces of information that play into the resident assessment protocol, the RAP, and they also potentially, potentially play a role in the care planning process. Let's say for the sake of discussion that I was your resident. And over time, you had noticed that I was having uh, a weight loss. And let's say that in a particular month, I lost 12 pounds. Well, it's likely that when my next care plan is due, or pardon me, it's likely that when I have a, I will have a care plan because I will have triggered because I've had dramatic weight loss. So as a part of my care team, as the person I get to work with most frequently, you would have the opportunity to go to, into the care planning process and say, you know, I've been working with Jeff now for quite a while. And I've noticed as I was doing his INOs, that his intake had been decreasing over time. And then the, um, the care plan coordinator, um, the medical director, the DON, whomever happens to be around the table, somebody might say, well, ha have you know, do you have any reason or any idea why Jeff has had less intake? And then you could say, well, the trays have been getting to the, um, to the bedside uh, with cool temperatures. Or you could say, well, I'm really not sure, um, but I did notice that Jeff is eating a lot of his soft food. He's just not eating like the meat and stuff like that, which could be helpful information to have in terms of coming up with a care plan to help me increase uh, my weight. So also when you're thinking about the care plan process, in, in the old days when they did care planning, Sometimes the care plan, the interdisciplinary team would come up with interventions or strategies or approaches to address a particular need without necessarily understanding how that, I, that strategy or that approach or that technique was going to affect the actual delivery of care. With you being there and participating in the care planning process, you will be able to say, hey, look, um, on the face of it, this sounds like a good idea. My concern is that we uh, don't have enough resources to make this a reality at the moment, which is really helpful for them to have that feedback. Um, I have a dear friend and she says uh, that she both loves and hates the yeah butters. She loves the yeah butters because they bring up realistic and valuable concerns uh, she, uh, she is not as fond of them because sometimes when her balloon is really full, 
um, that, that yell butters take a little bit of the air out of her balloon. And that's not always a fun thing as you might imagine. So you have the opportunity to participate in the care plan process. And I would encourage you if you were invited by your care plan coordinator, by your unit coordinator, by your director of nursing services, whomever invites you to participate in the process, I would encourage you to look at that as an opportunity to advocate, to speak on behalf of the women and men that you care for. Now, the new conditions of participation also talk to us about quality, and there are some really interesting roles that you can choose to play in that process. So, in the previous regulation from OBRA 87, there was a, a requirement to do quality assurance and assessment meetings and to have a quality assurance and assessment group. So the new regulation, um, it talks about quality assurance and performance improvement. And the quality assurance piece is really about looking at the things that we're not necessarily doing as well as we could at. Um, so for example, if you had an increase in the number of falls in your care setting, setting in your care center, it's quite possible that you would want to look at doing some quality assurance activities that, in, that decrease your falls uh, percentages. The performance improvement piece is really about looking at the things that you're doing well and seeing if there's a way that you can do them better. So I'll give you an example of this. Let's say on your last elder satisfaction survey, you received a score of 85% when it comes to overall elder satisfaction or customer satisfaction or resident satisfaction, however you'd frame that. And let's say that you as an organization thought, oh man, anybody can do 85%. We can do 95%. If you as an organization and you as a team believed that that was possible, then you could, could come up with ideas that you could implement that would hopefully get you to that 95%. Now, when it comes to, to nursing assistants, when it comes to caregivers, when it comes to folks like yourself, there are a variety of things you can do to contribute to the quality assurance and performance improvement process. The first thing that you can do is that you can pay attention to the things that are going well, and you can share that with your quality assurance and performance improvement team. The lead person for that team is called the Quapi Champion. And so you will want to find out who that person is in your center. So if there are things that you think are going wonderfully well, you can share that with them. Another way that you can help in the quality assurance and performance improvement process is by looking at the things that you think, man, I feel like we could do a little bit better with that. Um, for example, uh, if, if some of your elders were saying, you know, I really don't like the fact that, uh, uh, I only have two choices for, for lunch, two meal tr menu choices for lunch. Well, then you could make a note of that and share that back with your Quapi champion. And they could then think about whether it makes sense to include that as a part of their, of their quality assurance and performance improvement analysis and um, work. Another way that you as a nursing assistant could participate in that process is by volunteering to participate in what is referred to as an in performance improvement project. Um, we're not talking about Gladys Knight in the pips. Um, however, you could be a great pip. If you jumped in there and you volunteered to participate in a performance improvement project, performance improvement projects can take on a wide variety of different, uh, uh, of different looks. For example, a performance improvement project might be um, to have uh, your elders uh, on a weekly basis get together and have a group discussion about the things that they think are going well and the things that they think might use a bit of improvement. And you might use that as a strategy 
for checking uh, along the way to make sure that you're moving in the right direction in terms of achieving quality. Another performance improvement project might be uh, a situation where you adjust um, the times that you are turning. Uh, in, my, in my center, they called it tea time, and it happened 2QH or every two hours, and it stood for turning, toweling, and toileting. And everybody had to have tea time. Well, not everybody loved to be woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning to be repositioned or to be checked to see if they were dry or anything like that. So your performance improvement project may, may be to adjust the times and frequencies at which you are doing checks and things of that nature. The point in this is that um, you have, uh, as an advocate for the, men and women, the women and men that you care for, you have the opportunity to play a role in enhancing not only their quality of life, and their quality of health, but just their overall experience in the post-acute and long-term care settings. And so I encourage you, if you genuinely want to be an advocate for them, if you want to be their voice, if you want to be their helpmate so that they achieve the, uh, the best quality of life and quality of health that they can, I encourage you to look at the opportunity to participate in the uh, care planning process and the opportunity to participate in QAPI as honors. And I'd also like to encourage you to think of those as really great ways to ensure that your residents are getting the very best thing they can get. So it's been a really, uh, a real pleasure being with you today. And, and to, to kind of sum up our time, I'd like to look at a quote by Joan Baez. You don't get to choose uh, how you're going to die or when. You only decide how you are going to live. I encourage you to think about how am I going to live as an advocate. In our next episode, we are going to start to look at advocacy as it relates to the profession of certified nursing assistant. Look forward to seeing you then.